because things are so slow and there was so much. I mean, my heart was so kept in. We're going to have a very interesting speaker, I believe. Um, I actually don't have anything to talk about today. But um, I do have a couple other things we're going to get up and talk about. Just a couple things going on just to bring you up to date. Um, but one thing I do want to announce is the arrangements on the table. Um, whoever has a birthday this month can take it home. Um, and if there's multiple people, whoever is closest to you there. But that's just the, that's just the arrangements on the table. Please leave the plate. Oh, and the plate that's underneath, please leave it. Don't forget it. Who's you? Who's you? Now what? You mean we can just take it? Who's mad? The first person that's going to talk to is Nancy Jones. She's here today because we are actually going to have a at the first farmer's market. Um, and she wants to tell you guys. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, is this better? Yeah. Okay. So I have uh, two comments today. The first is I would like everyone to come down to the farmer's market on Saturday, June 17th. The RGC will have a group there from 9 to 1. Our goal is to do some community outreach to improve visibility in the club and our community on our events and activities on our town. We'll actually highlight two activities right in the booth. Uh, Los Musia and Shana Ramjanani will actually be conducting a free tree tour that will take place at 10.30. So sign up for that when the notice goes out and come on down to the booth and add to the energy. And then the second item, the second item will be highlighting the question of the garden tour. Pat Alto will be in the booth selling tickets, and it sounds like they'll tell you a little bit more about the tour. But today, I had also hoped to share a little garden tour anecdote myself, um, and that is um, when we started meeting this year as a board, we became aware of the importance of fundraising this year. Um, and also, I became how central the garden tour is to our financial picture. As you probably know, we're still recovering financially from our pandemic you know, stance. And the garden tour is an important part of us to raise funds. So uh, in addition to just buying my own ticket, I had sort of a new idea. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a sister that's also involved in various nonprofits, and one she's involved with this historic Salem, and they have a historic house tour every year. And so I can't tell you how many of these house tours I've attended. You know, every year I get the call, would you like to come to the tour? Here's the price of the tickets, here's the date. Okay, sure. And I go because we usually have a bunch of people that come together and it sort of kicks off the Christmas season and we plan a dinner after the tour. And um, it just never occurred to me to ask anybody to buy a Rockport garden club tour ticket and so this year I called my sister up and I said hey we're having this tour would you like to come and she said what's the date and gave the date and time she said fine I'm going online right now I'm buying a ticket and uh, and she bought a pair actually and it kind of took me by surprise because I, I really haven't been too involved in fundraising but it dawned on me how easy it can actually be <laughs> to do this. So I would encourage you, reach out to your social circle, but not only that, make an event of it, right? So invite some people up to Rockport, go on the tour, have a lunch, or have an event after. And um, I, you know, I say that also because I took a look at the garden tour, and these guys have really put together a fantastic roster of gardens, and I think it's going to be a beautiful event. And I just wanted to give them a plug. So. Thank you, Nancy. And Eleanor Juvier and somebody else coming to? Oh, and Monica Martin. They're going to talk to you about the tour. Okay, whichever. Okay, I'm not upset.
Okay. Uh, uh, Monica Lai and Diane Cartwright and I are uh, uh, chairing the volunteer uh, committee for the uh, garden tour. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who has already signed up for a slot uh, on the tour. We need about 60 volunteers altogether. We're almost there, but we still have about three or four gardens that we really need some help with. So if you yeah. have not signed up and you're available that day, I would uh, I encourage you to please sign up for a, a shift. Uh, if you're worrying that you won't have a chance to see the gardens yourself, uh, not to worry, because you'll have half the day on Saturday, plus on Friday morning, we have a three hour period as well, the day before from 10 till one, Yay. where you can go around and see the gardens as well. So if you would like to uh, sign up, you can do it online, or you can tell me or Diane uh, that you're ready to go, and, and we can help you with that. Um, Diane? Yeah. Yeah. Make sure they have to purchase a ticket if they do. The yes, book. you do need to purchase a booklet if you would like to go around to see the gardens. We will not have extra booklets on the day of the garden tour at the gardens. So if you're, you've signed up to volunteer but you haven't bought a ticket, you won't have a booklet and there won't be any there and you won't be able to go around. So I hope if you are signed up as a volunteer, you'll, you'll help us out and buy a booklet as well. That would be great. Uh, I bought tickets and where do I get the booklets? The book, yes, that was the next. Thank you. The booklets are in production. I think they're probably almost ready. Uh, Eleanor may have the, the news on that. They will be available at the, at the uh, farmer's market next Saturday. And there will also be another day, I think it was the 21st, was it, Eleanor, Wednesday. Wednesday morning from 10 to 12 at Eleanor's house, and she can tell you more about that. She'll be outside sitting with them so you can drop by and, and pick them up. Um, and as far as instructions are concerned, we will be sending out the instructions online via the same sign-up form that you use to sign up. And those will come out uh, before the end of next week with all the details you need uh, for the day itself. And uh, we'll have uh, chairs and umbrellas uh, on site if you need them and some pens for you, etc. Uh, but if you do have any questions, if this is your first time doing it and you have any questions right now, uh, feel free to, to ask uh, either one of us before you leave today. Yes, uh, this is a rain or shine event, from what I understand. So it's a dress appropriately, have your umbrellas, um, and really, I guess it's never happened. Is there a history that's been canceled for rain? It's never been canceled. It's never been canceled. It's never been canceled. Okay, so we did get rain on one of the two day tours. One yeah, it was rained out. Yeah, but uh, so let's uh, keep our fingers uh, crossed on that. But we took a walk through last week. The gardens are beautiful, and, and all the garden owners are really excited. So it's just a few pieces to put together, and one of those pieces is we need some extra. We still need a few more volunteers uh, to really cover the bases and to make sure that everyone who comes has a good experience and knows where to go and knows how to avoid getting hurt and all of that good stuff. So I, I think that's it. I think we've covered what we need. And if there's anything left to say, Eleanor will say it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eleanor Jubilar, one of the co-chairs for the Garden Tour this year. Um, so first, thank Nancy for the plug. We'll take it. Um, and thank Monica. So the gardens are amazing this year. As Monica mentioned, we did a quick run through last Friday. Beautiful day. And um, the gardens are very unique. And I encourage, if you haven't purchased a ticket and if you're available that day, and if you're volunteering or not, please, please come and see these gardens. So on Friday, as Monica mentioned, we will have a, the gardens will be open for the volunteers only and for the board. So again, if you need, um, you will need a ticket book. So you can pick those up at the farmer's market on Saturday, the 17th, and also on Wednesday between 10 and 12 at the end of my driveway. So I'll have a list. If either of those days don't work for you, please let me know. You can send me an email, um, or you can send, I think there's a general Rockport Garden Tour email, or let one of us on the on the committee know, and we'll arrange to get you your ticket book. So you can enjoy the gardens. 
I'm sorry? What is your driveway? My driveway is uh, 99 Marmion Way. <coughs> so I'll be just standing out there. And you don't have to pull in. You just drive right by and pull over, and I'll just <laughs> hand you your books. And if, if you can't make it, and if you want uh, a friend, another volunteer to pick up your book, that's fine too. I'll just take both of your names. So this will come out in an email as well. So my driveway is the 20. We decide 21st, 21st, which is next Wednesday, 21st, between 10 and 12. And that email will come from Diane and me, uh, having to do with the volunteers. So you will get that next week, and separately you will get a, um, a instructions. So what, be on the lookout for two different emails from us. And um, one other note. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, will there be any tickets for sale that day? So yes. So tickets tickets are on sale now online. They'll be on sale at the farmers market. And then they'll be on sale on the actual tour date at Farletta Park and also at the police station. And if you have pre-purchased them and you can't get them any other way, you can also pick them up on that day of the tour as well. And one other quick note, um, thank you to all the volunteers. As you know, this event doesn't run with, certainly without the gardens and the garden owners, but it's, it does not run without the volunteers. So thank you all very much. On that day, um, please make sure that you are ready for the weather. So if it's, we will have some umbrellas. We're hoping they're just to prevent the sun from shining on you. But if it does rain, be, be prepared. And um, we do have one water station. We'll have water at the police station and water at one of the gardens. So if it's really hot, I'll be wandering around with water for the volunteers as well, but if it's a regular day, not too hot, I'll try and do that, but bring a Yeti or something with you, just so you have water while you're there. Yes? I have a, a may, might be a stupid question. So I'm bringing my invalid mom uh, that Saturday morning. So <clears throat> can I stop by and get two booklets so I don't have to go to the police station and stand in a long line? So if, if her name and your name are on the list, yep. absolutely. Perfect. Thank yep. you. Yep. That'd be fine. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all, and uh, we look forward to seeing you Saturday. And let's hope for a nice sunny day that's not too hot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, Shipper, are you going to do our introduction? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I just, it just came to mind because I just got my like, Adam off with all the hopes. And are we going to go on sale this year or that's going to be um, actually, we are going to have to make it to the and um, so some back there, and then the Zion Park, um, we're going to head that up, and it's going to be held at the last farmer's market, uh, we will have a booth there. And I don't know what their decision was about selling them in advance of that, but it will be that one. Yeah. Just a uh, question. If people need aprons, um, how do we get them? How do they get them? Um, I mean, I know we got it when we joined. If, if you need, need an apron, contact Cynthia. Is that what? If she needs an apron. Uh, yeah. I do. I, mean, I, I put mine in a very safe place. Um, <laughs> 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 I think Nine Marmion Way. Nine Marmion? Nine Marmion. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Um, sure, do you want to do the introduction? <laughs> Hello, you can hear me, right? No. Well, today's, uh, today's speaker is Dave Aranio of uh, Aranio Networks. <coughs> today's speaker is Dave Aranio of uh, Aranio Landworks. Um, 
he doesn't really need much of an introduction, I would say, uh, because both Dave and Nan have been good friends of the club for a number of years. Um, you may all, I mean, those of us who've been around a bit uh, recall, may recall that they've donated several things for auction at Upland Sale. In addition, of course, to participating in our garden tour, which, you know, the garden has always been a big hit. So, uh, today, Dave is going to talk to us about hardscapes. Uh, so, using natural stone and creating hardscapes in the garden. Is that, is that about right, Dave? Yeah. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Okay, wow, that works. Okay, there. Now, uh, well, look, um, is, is that clear, though? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So I, I was going to start out just just talking about the geology of this area of Cape Town. Uh, massive amount of granite that we have, this beautiful granite we have around us, was formed about 600 million years ago, and it's igneous rock, it was a melted rock um, under the earth that as it was pushed up, it started to cool, and, and the minerals started to crystallize and cool them as it was pushed to the surface. But it's a very slow action, not like a volcano where everything is just thrown all over the place. And the other type of rock that we have is the basalt. And you can see the basalt would just kind of push its way up from, from below and cause these veins or intrusions. And you've probably all seen the black basalt intrusions around Cape Ann. Uh, yeah. So if you haven't, you'll, you'll notice them. Because there, there's so many of these faults everywhere around. Um, so, and then about 200 million years ago, this big continent, which part of it was the Cape Ann Granite, split apart. And it formed, this is called continental drift. And, um, you know, there is Cape Ann granite that just moved across the ocean it's, and it's now in Europe, in China, and even in Antarctica. They're finding the same formation that we have here. Um, and it's interesting, I was, in the winter, uh, Dan and I go to Arizona. We stay in a small town and they actually brought a London Bridge. They, they thought they were bringing the London Bridge out, but it turned out to be a London Bridge. But just walking across it one day, I was looking at the granite that, that it was built from, and sure enough, it was Cape, Cape Ann granite. Now, our, our Cape Ann granite varies from quarry to quarry. It's all, once you get familiar with it, you can notice, well, this came from uh, Pigeon Hill, or this came from Lanesville, or wherever. Uh, but it's really interesting seeing Cape Ann granite that was brought from Europe and was now in Arizona. <laughs> the next major, I'm sure there's a lot going on between 200 million years ago and the Ice Ages, but, but the Ice Ages greatly affect what we now see around Cape Ann, uh, especially in the last Ice Age. The Ice Ages are relatively recent. They're only about two million years ago. Um, but the last ice age that we had here, which was only about 10,000 years ago, which in, in geological time is really a short period. Uh, and this, this glacier now, you have to remember, these things were like a mile high. And we were right at the end of the glacier. And every summer, it would be melting, and all this water would be pouring out. And, and, and the glacier is full of all the stones and grit that it pushed, but it's moving across the, the continent. And it ended up, like, the, the, the sand particles were out on, that's what made Cape Cod. And here, it dropped all these big boulders and rocks, 
and unfortunately, not a lot of soil. We have, you know, pretty much you know, thin soil here. Uh, but these rocks got tumbled by the scraping of the glaciers, also by all the water that was running down, tumbling everything. And then, of course, the ocean it was pushed into the ocean. The ocean was tumbling the rocks as well. So if you walk around in the woods here, you'll notice um, these tumbled rocks that um, are quite attractive. But then, when the Europeans came over, you know, they discovered this wonderful resource of granite uh, that actually, it's hard, but it cuts very well. It cuts some nice straight lines. So they started quarrying like crazy. And this started in the 1700s, and it lasted until, you know, about 1940, maybe. Uh, and at that time, you know, the, they started using poured concrete, so they didn't need the building blocks that they were using for everything. And they, and they were using asphalt as well as concrete to make roads, and so they didn't need the cobblestones. Uh, but the Cape Man, during the uh, Cape Man uh, quarrying days, the granite was shipped all, all over the world. Uh, and I remember one time being stuck in a traffic jam at the Lincoln Tunnel, crossing over from New Jersey to New York. And I, I kind of look over, and I'm noticing the granite walls. And they were dirty from all the soot. <laughs> But it was it was Cape May granite right there. Uh, but you see it everywhere. It's it's in Washington D.C. Um, it's it's all over the place. Uh, but when this all ended, of course, uh, the coal quarry industry they they dug out massive amounts of granite and they stripped the island of trees and they just had trains and. Barges, and it was a really busy industry. Uh, when they left, they left piles of rock, which we call ground, ground piles. Um, they also, the independent quarry people, preferred having their own little quarries. They dug these little pits everywhere, and these were called motions. Uh, so when they left, um, nature got to work restoring the area. And um, I'm really impressed with the, with the way this occurred. Uh, the quarries filled up with this beautiful artesian water, water that from deep down in the ground and the little seams of the ground, water seeped up. Um, the, those little quarries, I was talking about the motions, uh, became vernal pools, which were uh, wonderful areas for wildlife. The ground, the ground piles became, you know, dens for animals. Um, the trees just grew up through everything. And it's, it's quite a unique environment. Uh, and, uh, and this is important, I feel, in shaping the landscaping that we have on Cape Man. And you can see that you know, there's granite walls everywhere, and um, and you know, you know, most of the stone you see in the granite walls was stuff was just left over because they only used the best granite that they shipped away. So now we're left with this abundance of leftover, oh, excuse me, <laughs> quick, wow, so here we go, here they are, taking the granite out, work, 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 okay, one more, and, you know, this is a good example of, of how, I mean, this is Drumlin Hill up here, this is Flat Lake Quarry, this is actually where I live, at the Ox Farm, and you can see the only tree here is this elm tree that actually died around 1950 with the Dutch elm disease. But if you look at it now, click, 
<laughs> you know, like now it's, well, this is actually still there, but, yeah. but it looks like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and here, you know, this is a quarry. Actually, there's a motion right down here. But it shows you how nature restored this area. And, you know, there's lots of rocks that were left, and now the lichens are covering them. The pitch pines are growing through the cracks, and they look like natural bonsais. Uh, it's an amazing way that the area has been restored. This is a grout plat. And, uh, you know, I often try to do that in my landscape. You know, and this is total red. This is accidental art. Mm -hmm. You know, the rocks were left here, and then nature took over. And, and that's all over the place. Uh, so the raw materials that we have, you know, are the stone left over, and we have the glaciers left us all these beautiful boulders and rocks, and we still have some ore reading that's being done. You know, if, if, if we need a fresh piece of granite, it is available now. Yes, it, uh, so, you know, I feel a tension with our natural environment and love trying to recreate it in the work that we do. Okay. So now we're getting into walls. And here we have, this would be, you know, sort of a typical masonry wall. Um, now, one of the things about this is the color of the stone. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, one of the things that was really prized with the cave and granite was not only you know, the minerals that you see, the, the micas and felspars, but also that there's, there's color to it. And, and that brown color, they, for some reason they call it sapstone. And that was actually oxidation water would kind of go through the seams, and it's it's a form of rust that, that forms. But it gives it a really nice color. Now, uh, one of the things I was going to mention is that whenever you build a masonry wall like this, you really need a good foundation, because if there's any movement at all, the everything things will crack, and it, it won't last very long. But this one's obviously built on ledge on the solid core of granite here. Uh, let me see, anything else in this picture? Uh, these are interesting. Oh, and the other thing about a masonry wall is having a cap on the wall will preserve it because it keeps water from penetrating inside and with the freezing it can crack. And you can see a lot of walls that are falling down because because of that freezing process. Now, if it starts to happen, you just remove some of the cement and just put more cement in. It's called pointing, pointing a wall. Um, and here, you know, the, oh, and the colors. Look, look at the colors here. Yeah, this is all Cape Bay granite. And, you know, these people didn't like the, the gray rock. They reminded them of tomb, tombstones, so we had to go find <laughs> All this colored rock for them. But uh, it turned out nice. Okay. And so this wall, you would call this a dry stack wall. However, it's probably not really dry stack. There's probably cement behind it. But it's made to look like there's no water in it at all. Now, it's always important to have good drainage behind the wall. So these walls, you know, there's crushed stone that is behind this, and then there's little weep holes so that any water that gets in there can come out. And this it, it, this is so important in maintaining a lawn. And you know, I also what I like about this are the other elements involved. Here we have the natural ledge here, and how this kind of all fits into it. And and then, you know, the woods is over here, and then this is sort of a shade garden. Um, okay. And this is another wall also built on the ledge. 
And you know, these are just you know pieces of granite that they didn't want. They were discarded and you know, put together. Uh, and this is another one, uh, a similar kind of wall. I mean, this is, I'm sure this is all cemented, and I'm sure it has weep holes. Uh, okay, on this one here, see, this is this is a tumbled rock. This is not quarry. You can see that these have a soft edge. So, so these rocks, you know, came from, from the glacier. Uh, okay. And, and look at these, these are beautiful pieces of granite here. Uh, so, you know, this stuff is still available. Uh, this stone, you know, it's probably stuff that was left over, but, but we cut it so that it would, it would have this, this, this shape. And uh, again, it's all cemented and it works really well. So there's not, not much could happen to a wall like that. <laughs> oh, and these, these are some of my favorite ones. I, I call these farmer walls. And, uh, you know, the, the poor farmers that tried to farm Cape Van, uh, if you go out in the woods, you'll see where they, well, it's typically all over New England, they would, with all the rocks, they would get rid of the rocks in the fields, so they would make walls. They really, they, they did make, they, the purpose was really to get rid of the rocks, but the walls became useful also. Uh, and we also have farmer's walls in Cape Man. But this one here, they're very easy to build, no foundation necessary. It doesn't matter if they move around a little bit with the frost. But these rocks here were probably, I mean, you can see they're highly tumbled, they're highly soft. And it, it probably had to do with the ocean, you know, uh, probably tumbling it. But uh, a nice, simple, economic wall. Uh, okay. Oh, so now, the boulder walls. And these, these are my favorite. Uh, uh, you know, this, this, was, this hillside was unmanageable. And these people tried so many things to, to, to retain it, to keep it from washing down. And finally, you know, uh, they had us come over and, and we do this all the time with boulders. And we just, just built up with boulders. We started from the bottom and built up to the top. And, and, uh, and then, but of course, using boulders like this, the plants are so important. If you just saw this without any plants, it would not look very attractive at all. Uh, but with, with all the softening of the greenery, uh, it looks, you know, pretty much, it's, it's trying to make it look like a natural hillside. Uh, This is also by far the most e economical way to maintain a hillside. Uh, okay, so here's another one. And this is, this is an interesting one because you have the, the natural boulder retaining and then you have all this finished, beautiful finished work up top. And again, without, without the vegetation, this would not look, it really wouldn't look good at all. But with the vegetation, and that's why it's important, because we have such a long uh, cold season here, to have some evergreen uh, plants involved in this type of landscape. Okay, oh, and this, okay, so now we're kind of moving to pathways, but this is, um, as you see, older retaining, actually a nice little finished wall above. But these rocks, uh, I, I call them natural steps. And so these are just pieces of granite uh, that were found locally. You know, sometimes we even get blasted, which uh, sometimes comes out like that. 
But, uh, but the problem with using these type of steps is it's hard to make them perfect. You know, it's important to get good at steps to have an equal amount each time, and it's hard to do that with these steps, and they're not perfectly uh, <coughs> smooth on top. So a railing like this helps. Uh, okay? And this is another one. And this is almost a goat path, I call it, where the rocks are not very even. Uh, and this works. You wouldn't want it as a major entryway. But it looks good. Yeah. And here we go. This is... Uh, these stones are, are, are very, you know, very well crafted and put together. And... Uh, this stone, I'm not sure where it came from. I mean, it's Cape Van Granite. But, you know, I think this is just stuff we found. I don't think it was, it was cut for this. But this is a good example of a masonry, of masonry steps using big pieces of stone. Oh. <laughs> and, this, and this is probably my favorite. These, <laughs> these pieces here are curve stones, and most of it came from the big dig. And so we so we buy this stuff from salvage companies, and it used to be so available during the big dig, and uh, it wasn't expensive. Now it's getting really hard to find, but and it was always nice. Because some of it was Cape Van Granite. And to see the Cape Van Granite coming back home, uh, I always appreciated using the Cape Van Granite. But it works really well. Uh, it's not perfect. You know, it's a little bit rough. But it has a really nice organic look. And it, it's, it's forgiving. It doesn't have to be perfect the way it intersects with everything. And it, uh, it, but it's, it is pretty, it is easy to maneuver. It works really, really well. Okay, and here's some more. Actually, this is the same picture. But also, you know, it's really good when you, if you design steps, not to have, if, if it's possible, not to have too many in a row, and have four, you know, and then, you know, and have no more than four is good if you can do it, and then have a have a, a platform to go up on. Uh, where where was that? Where, where was that? The one we just saw? Yeah. Uh, it's right off of Grand Street. Okay. It, yeah. It's actually, uh, uh, Granite Pier is right over there. And you, you can see this from the water. Uh, this, this one. And look, at, these are beautiful pieces of granite here. And you can see this is a gray one. This is has a little color to it. Uh, so it's nice to be able to have granite like that and use it. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, now, now we're in the pathways. So here we have garden paths using natural granite stone. Uh, you know, it works really well, it looks really well. It's a little bit uneven. It's not, you know, that easy to walk on it always. You can't really shovel it very well. But, <laughs> but it looks good. Really, yeah, it looks good. <laughs> uh, this one. Yeah, so uh, these are two examples of using natural stone in a pathway. Now, one thing I want to say about pathways is it's important, I mean, uh, actually, switch one more, I think. Okay. So here we have a straight pathway. And straight pathways are not my favorite thing, but sometimes they're necessary, and sometimes people really like them, so what, you know, do it. Um, but whenever you start putting curves, you have to make sure, because people will take the path of least resistance. So, if you're going to curve something, you have to. There has to be a reason for it. So you either have to you have to obstruct it from people 
trying to go straight. Uh, and it's funny because this job here, you see this stone here? The person here wanted to be able to get up on their deck and not go all the way around. She insisted on doing it. And so eventually, we put this railing in there, in there and now she can't do it anymore. <laughs> Uh, but now we're into blue. This is bluestone, and bluestone is a shale, and it doesn't come from here. It comes from uh, Pennsylvania and New York State. Uh, but we use a lot of it, and it, it works so well here. Uh, and for a long time, uh, a finished granite. Thin piece, they were not very available. Now they are. It's not Cape Man granite, but there is lots of granite materials now that can be used just like we use the bluestone. But this type here, this is the irregular type. It comes in a pallet of these, these, these irregular pieces, but they can be cut to fit really well. And we have a cobblestone border. A cobblestone border or any border is not really necessary with bluestone. But it, it really does look good. And, and this type here, both types, these are rectangular pieces. But both of these is called full color because it does have a little color. Now, you know, some people really don't like this, but, but I do. I, I like the color. Uh, okay, switch. And this is a cobblestone walkway, which is, it looks good, but it's, it's not as smooth. As the blue stone. Uh, okay, here we go. Here's another blue stone with lots of curves. It's rectangular pieces, full color, uh, nice flow. Okay, and we could have gone straight over, but so just that gentle curve to me makes a lot of difference, and it's not enough of a curve that people are going to cut straight across. Uh, but it's great because you can mow right over it, it's low maintenance, it's easy to install. Uh, and, if, yeah. and this pathway, it's a little different, I don't know if you can see it, but there's separation between, so it's not tight, and gravel stone is put in here. And it, it, it works well. You can you can shovel it, uh, and this goes from a one method to a stepping stone method and back again to this. Um, so that you know that's that's another form that works really well. Oh, so now patios. Actually, one of my sons uh, does the railings for us. Yeah. Yeah. So here we have a patio of the, the same thing. It's the irregular pieces that are fit together. And it's the full color. It has the different colored pieces. OK. And and this is an interesting project, so I had to show it. Uh, the blue stone here is it's called thermal. It's all the same color. Uh, it, it does come in different shapes, but this, these are all squares. But um, the walls here are interesting. And this is a fire pit. But all these, these radius pieces, um, someone comes and does a computer image and then we bring the pieces of Cape Ann granite, and they saw it, and they shape this, and they even have to fire it, because after you saw it, it doesn't look very good, so it, it gets heated with a torch, to, and it brings out the grain. And they come, and we just, sure enough, put it right on top of the cap, and it usually all fits perfectly. It's pretty amazing. Uh, okay. And this is, this is actually the same project. Uh, okay. And this is a cobblestone patio. 
And, you know, it looks really good in this site, uh, but it is a little rough. Uh, but it looks good. <laughs> okay. And this is another one around the pool. Full color. And this one I have to throw in. Uh, it's not stone. This is pavers. Uh, we don't usually do pavers, but you know it looks really good. And the wall. And this is you know this is a uh, field stone wall, uh, but it really works. And I, you know one thing I like. I really like the fact there's a little piece of ledge sticking into the patio, and now there is a little bit of stuff growing in the seam here. Uh, that looks nice and so off, is it? Okay. Is that our granite pier? That is a, a quarry road. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I'm missing anything here. Yeah. Oh. So, um, the, thing, the one thing about patios is that they do need a pitch to them so that the water will run off. And um, we often use a product in between the stones. You know, they look really tight, but it, it's a polymer sand that, that we put in between the stones. And now they have a polymer sand that is actually pervious. I don't know how they do it. but. You know, one of the problems with patios is when it rains, you want them to dry as quickly as possible. So the pitch helps a lot. But then there's always still water. So, you know, with the polymer sand that allows the uh, water to run through it, it just tends to dry faster. Uh, okay. So I was going to talk about dry parking areas. Um, and I've always asked, for alternatives to asphalt. Uh, and there aren't many really. Uh, you know, asphalt works, it's you know, it's not the most attractive, but it does work well and it is it is e economical. But the alternatives that are available, and this is just a gravel driveway. And if you have a gravel driveway, it, you know, it's soft, it looks good, but it is going to require maintenance, it is going to require some raking and additional stone. And if you have to snow plow it, you're going to have piles of stones everywhere. And the poor, I just always feel sorry for whoever snow plows this type of driveway. I used to do it, and nobody likes you after you plow the driveway. <laughs> but containing it is important. This has a cobble containing. Uh, steel edge works well also. Uh, and the other thing I want to mention is, is adding these cobblestone aprons, you call them, really works well with any driveway situation. And I'm, I'm sure we'll see more as we proceed. Uh, here's another gravel driveway. Uh, you, know, the, you can actually get different color stones. Uh, there's a lot of different types of gravel that you can use. Uh, Okay, and of course, good old cobblestone. It's hard to beat that. It's not cheap though. Uh, and here is cobblestone with asphalt. Uh, let's just flip one more. And here's the asphalt with a, with a nice big apron uh, at the beginning of it. Uh, okay, so, oh, okay, so now, we are into other things. <laughs> More fun things, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, we do a few of these every year. Uh, and it's, you know, uh, I always, it's really just trying to make it look like it's, it's real or it's from nature. And this one worked out pretty well. Um, 
and you know, a flip of work. Uh, we used to we used to do a lot of ponds, uh, and but the ponds require a lot of maintenance. You know, filters, and even with the filters, they get leaves get in them, and you know, people started getting tired of cleaning the ponds. <laughs> and so most of the things we do now, uh, I call them dry ponds, because uh, flip over time. There's, there is a water underneath this. There's, we use a, a rubber liner, and there's a pump somewhere in there. And it, we just fill it with, the, with stone, gravel stone, and the water just goes into it. It doesn't require any filtering. Uh, and if you want to have a little water, you can remove some of this and have a little water right here so you get the sound of water on water. And, it, and these are relatively easy and old, but you can also plant water plants right in this because there's water right under this. So you can put uh, you know, cattails or whatever you want. Uh, okay. And this site I call a water feature where it's more of a design with water. And again, there's water underneath all this. And this one, uh, actually this one was inspired from being in Arizona and going through canyons where these canyons were cut by all the water from the glaciers. And they cut these canyons and sometimes a stone would get get jammed right into the canyon. And I've seen this a number of times where a stone is jammed in between a canyon wall. So there it is right there. Okay. And oh this is interesting. This this is I wish I had something a measuring or something. This is a huge water trough that when we were doing the work it was buried in the ground. And it's really, it was a beautiful piece of uh, 18, what is it, 18 something, 18 of 62, yeah. And so we just picked it up and made a little water feature out of it. Landmark Lane, right? Yeah. And so, here we go again. This is, this, all this granite was just thrown around. You know, just being lost, and it now is reborn and has become a, a sculpture, a walkway. Yeah. Okay. And here are just some, just some things to do with rocks. You know, just little garden ornaments. <laughs> This is actually, you see the curves here? Uh, this is curved stone. And you know, in the streets you see the curved granite. So, we were able to get some of that too, the big dig. Okay. And they make nice mailbox holders and light fixtures and little things. <laughs> Mailboxes. <laughs> Low maintenance, you know, you just put them up there. Okay. Oh, and bird bats. Um, and these, these look so nice in the garden. And this one I actually found, I didn't have to cut this one out, but any stone we can carve it and make it into a bird bath. And, you know, it, the birds really like it. And they're very low maintenance. You know, you have to clean them out sometimes, and you have to be aware of, of mosquito larvae getting in there. But I, I just go around and you know check them once in a while. You see the little larvae going around, you just clean it right out. Uh, okay. Oh, and benches. Um, these benches, you know, they're typical with the pedestals and the stone over it, and. You know, 
they, they're okay to sit on, and but more important, it kind of makes the feel the area feel. It just makes it feel good having a, a place to sit down, and sometimes you can sit on them. <laughs> but, uh, but they work okay. I, I, now, there's actually a number of them uh, of other stones. Go ahead. See this. This is a patio that you saw with, with a, a bench along the side. Uh, here is another bench over there. And yeah, they're nice. You can put, use them to put flower pots on. Okay. And this, oh, this is cool. This just is a piece of granite that three people can sit on. Uh, and here we have, oh, okay. Well, you know, this is another little moon gate here. And uh, that was constructed just using a, a garbage can as a form and just build the rocks around it. And then with a little gentle kick. Uh, and you know, you know what's amazing about this is it looks so, it, it, it really looks fragile. Uh, but it's been there for at least 15 years through kids and grandkids and falling trees. And uh, I, I, I thought it would last a couple weeks, and there it is. Because the force of gravity, you know, with the whole arch principle, and why an arch is so strong, if it, if for some reason, with the gravity pushing rock on rock, uh, like, uh, okay. So there's nothing holding those together? No, no. It's like the pigeon pole with the bridge, the yeah, stone bridge. bridge. There you go. Yeah. No, there's nothing at all. No, that's that's just now. You know, when I kick the garbage can out, you know, they kind of you can tell it's not a perfect circle, but it's been there for all these years. Wow. And, and the go ahead, one more. And this one here doesn't. You know, there is a little bit of cement in there, but that's not what's holding it together. The only reason I put a little cement was because I didn't I, I didn't want to see light through it. it uh, and it was a mistake because people come look at it and they say, oh, this cement is holding it together. But it's not. And, uh, and that's your yard, right? Yeah. Yes. yeah. So I wonder if I missed anything. Let me go back. Uh, well, I hope I was able to share with you today a little of what I experience and love in this amazing landscaping that we have available to us here. Uh, now, there's another whole topic that um, I was going to give, and it's about it's about water. Uh, you know, here on Cape Man, we have water, a fair amount of water, but there's times we have droughts. Water is very expensive, um, but it's just time for people to have a different attitude, I feel, about water. And, and, and so there's a lot going on with, uh, with capturing rainwater. And luckily, my buddy Isaac Thoreau, who just happened to be here today, is, is going to take over on this. But um, so even if you don't want the water or save the water, you still have to deal with it. So. You know, the water can be diverted into gardens where the ground will absorb it. Or, in the last case scenario, there are things that can be made called rain gardens that you can bring the water to and it'll absorb enormous amounts of water. And at the same time, you can make that into a landscape feature. And there's certain plants that will grow in this rain garden that do very well in that type of environment. Uh, so uh, after Isaac talks uh, about rainwater harvesting, uh, then we'll have questions and answers. No questions, and hopefully I can answer. <laughs> okay. Thanks for having me, Dave, thank you. Um, just wanted to really introduce myself to the Garden Club. My name is Isaac Duro, uh, our coordinator. 
Yeah. And, you got to swallow uh, the mic. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> and so I'm from Earthwater Design Solutions, uh, located in Gloucester. And I focus on uh, rainwater harvesting, design, and consulting. And just wanted to talk to you a little bit about rainwater harvesting and what it is. You're probably all familiar with a little bit of it. Um, really, there, there are two, two types of rainwater harvesting or, or ways to harvest water. Which you probably know, active water harvesting, which is you're collecting water into some kind of container like a rain, rain barrel. It could be a five gallon bucket, it could be a rainwater tank. Above ground or below ground, it could hold hundreds or even thousands of gallons of water. And those are great because you can use that water on days when it's not raining, right? Um, and, that's, and they can come in, as you've probably seen, all shapes and sizes. And if you go on, online and, and, and search rainwater harvesting, you'll see hundreds if not thousands of options. But the other thing I want to talk to you about was another way of harvesting water, which is called passive rainwater harvesting, or what, 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 what David was talking about, earth, earthworks. So you're shaping the land to attract the water so when it, when it does rain, the rainfall is directed into the soil immediately for, for use. And these are typically what you've probably seen or heard of in rain, rain gardens. But there are a lot of other ways to do it. But rain, rain gardens are great, right? They're little basins in your yard that um, you, you put plants in, you direct water to, whether it's from your downspout, or it can also take like overflow water from a rain barrel or a rainwater tank. But you could also make them very simple and make them into, they, 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 they could just be planting beds where you're directing the water right into your planting bed to feed it. So whenever it rains, you're passively always harvesting that water, but you're always watering your landscape. Um, so there are other things too that are um, called bioswales or swales, ways that you can move water around your property and have plants in them as well. And as you know, as you all know, as gardeners, the more compost you put in there, organic mulch, it just becomes this huge sponge. You just create this big, big sponge. So that's part of what I, what I do, is I show people, you, you, you all plant your bulbs and your seeds. What I do is I try to show people how to plant the rain. Get the rain, put it back into the ground. Farm, farm that rain off the surfaces, put it right into the ground. Um, but the passive rainwater harvesting or earthworks, I really feel is, is, is a fundamental strategy for um, like water conserving and sustainable landscapes. Because once you create these features, not only is it going to harvest rainwater, but it will harvest water, like I said, from overflow from a rainwater tank, um, some pump discharges, um, air conditioning, condensate, um, even stormwater runoff, stormwater from your driveway or even patios, and they become a great landscape feature. And it also, you can use it to put your uh, town water or, or well water in, even. And I think the great thing about rainwater harvesting, too, is you're, you're collecting the water right at the source and you're using it right there. You're not getting it from the town, from the water department, or even from your well, which obviously takes a little bit of energy to get it up from the ground. Um, so those are just some of the things I do. So I do rainwater harvesting designs and consulting for individuals, businesses, like architects, other engineering companies. Um, one of my uh, municipal clients is the town of Ipswich now, where as you can imagine they're always concerned about water, and we're really trying to promote there's some really exciting things there, promoting rainwater harvesting. And just showing people how to use this resource that I that I see is sometimes discarded, wasted. And how can we turn it into a, into a useful resource? It's there. Obviously, it has to rain for us to collect it. But when it does rain, even little amounts of rainwater, as you probably know if you have a rain barrel, can fill up your rain barrel or your rain garden. And it can have and you can collect a lot of water, even on these little events where it's an eighth of an inch of water, a quarter of an inch. So, 
Yeah, so a lot of exciting things are happening there, and uh, I just want to introduce myself, and Dave, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for letting me be here, and um, I'd like to get to know this group and anything I could do to support your causes. Um, I'd, I'd love to, and answer any questions whenever that time is. So, thank you. In the Bissell House project over in Ipswich with the rain catching? I was not. That was one of my, um, that was my engineering teacher who did that. Really? <laughs> yes. It was but very interesting. Very interesting. They, they <laughs> harvest two 2,500 gallon cistern tanks and they have a groundwater recharge system. And you can, I mean, we would put a couple in ourselves where you, you're putting the, the these concrete tanks below ground. <laughs> Um, obviously you need a pump to get that water out, but once you get that water out, you can use it like a hose picket or drip irrigation, spray irrigation if you need to. So there's so many options that you can do. Obviously you get into pumps and electrical, it gets a little more complex. So what I try to do is keep things as simple as I can, have everything flow control by gravity. Um, and I always say take the approach like Dave does, maybe unconsciously, but this permaculture approach, work with nature, not against it. Really always working with it and trying to make these systems functional, practical, but also looking, look, look really good. Thank you. I do have a few, yes. <laughs> So, are, are there any questions? Oh, okay. Um, so, on the colors, you were saying granite can also have color. Is there a technique to use to bring out the color? Uh, can you repeat well, your question? Oh, oh. Your question? on colors. Yes. Yeah. Oh, one. Okay, hello? Yeah. 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 Well, the question was about bringing out the colors in granite. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there it is. Um, I have a granite table um, that we put um, oil on. Um, we use a is it, well, let's say, linseed well, oil, and it brings it, it gives it more color. It brings it out. Um, so I don't know if you can buy linseed oil anymore. I hope not. You can. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, that's why my house burned down, so I hope you can't buy it. <laughs> but you probably wouldn't want it to go over a huge area. I mean, it was a table. But you talking about a whole wall or something? I was just curious. Yeah. 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 I have yeah. I was reading in a history of the granite industry, and they said, they, I think it was in the 1800s or early 1900s, that people use stone dust for fertilizer for their um, gardens. Is that, have you heard of Absolutely. that? Absolutely, yeah. And why does that work? Because it's loaded with minerals. Oh. Uh, and it takes a while for it to break down. It's not <laughs> instant, you know, release. Um, you know, around here, I mean, I don't, I, I, I do a lot of gardening. And I don't really use stone dust, <laughs> but people buy it in other parts of the country for that purpose. And I think around here, I think we already have so much granite in the soil anyway. But I'm not. But I don't know this for a fact. I mean, maybe it would be good to add more stone dust to it. <laughs> when you have um, field stone uh, stepping stones and you don't have a lawn, as you showed in one of your slides, what do you do to fill between the cracks to stop every weed in the neighborhood? Come <laughs> 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 weeds. Yeah. So you, you, you're talking about um, how much separation between the stones you're talking about. Okay, well, you can use the, that polymer sand I was talking about. Uh, no, more than that. No, I understand. That's good for... <clears throat> but when you have maybe an inch, you know, you know there's you, you can still use polymer sand for that. Oh. Uh, now, you know, what, what I like doing is growing uh, ground cover, like yeah. thyme or something around it. 
Uh, I've tried that and the time always dies. It did? <laughs> In fact, this last winter, all my creeping time died because of the cold. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else had um, used Another idea is to just pour vinegar. Yeah. And yeah. It's salt, salt, salt and vinegar. vinegar. Salt, yeah. But then it, but then it just seeps. Yeah. Contain it. Yeah. Uh, it's true. But it does, it does stop from <coughs> germinating. Yeah. 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 Good. Good point. Yeah. But if you only have small one-inch or you know spaces, the polymer sand works. It's not perfect. I mean, look at. Look at Dunkin' Donuts. I drove by there the other day. If you looked in the parking lot of the old Dunkin' Donuts, yes. there's grass growing through the asphalt. You know, nature is going to take right over if we left here in no time. But the polymer sand works pretty good. Um, and, and they, how big a gap? Well, no, they, they make some for larger gaps. It, Great. Yeah. Thank you. Questions. Uh, the first one is just about the quarries in general. I moved here from Illinois last year, and I live at Ocean Ledges, which I guess is near you, right by yeah. the Keystone Bridge. Yeah. Uh, is that Flat Ledge Quarry yeah. or yes. Carlson? I, it's both. I, it's both. Oh, <laughs> it's mainly Flat Ledge. Wait, is that true? Yeah, is that true? Yeah. No. Oh, okay, so Carlson is up, where is that, Zero Top? Carlson is way up in the woods. Okay, yeah. That's flat ledge. That is flat ledge. There's actually another name for flat ledge that they use. Uh, but Carlson is up above. Have you ever walked above? Yeah, because I could. Okay. Yeah. Didn't they dam that one up there? Yes. Yeah. 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 And then I, my second question yeah. was the movement of the rocks uh, by the seashore. I came here as a teenager in the early 1960s, and I, I can't figure out what beach we went to, but uh, I, I think it was uh, Cape Hedge because you had to climb over the rocks. Mm -hmm. But I remember a huge boulder as you look out at the sea to the right that I went and did sunbathing on, and I, I don't see any any <laughs> beach that has that anymore. So I was wondering, can something that huge just yes. from the 60s, you know, just disappear? Well, I'll, I'll tell you something. You know, the storm of 91, the no-name storm, um, we, at that time we were living very close to the ocean, and we actually had a lot of damage, but trying to get to my house, that day, um, there was the water was coming over the road, and the the, the stones were bobbing around. They, they they looked like styrofoam. The, the ocean, the power of the water lightens the stone anyway, mm -hmm. but then the force of it moves it around. So you know the, 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 the sea coast is it's very dynamic. It's constant, especially that area over there is moving. Mm -hmm. um, so a stone, a big stone. Is not a permanent not fisher a at all. <laughs> but maybe it's somewhere else. Maybe you can find it. <laughs> Why are motions called motions? Oh, I don't know. Can anyone answer that? <laughs> Why is motion in small little quarries called a motion? Even Bob Kirkwood didn't have a motion. Oh, really? <laughs> maybe it's not. Maybe uh, that change is like the, the Toshin or something. <laughs> well, I, I realize you do large projects, but if you're just looking for a few pieces, you get a small yard, like a natural stepping stone. Yeah. Where do you source? Where would are there places to source small pieces of stone? Well, you can come. You can talk to me. Yeah. Okay, I'm always trying to find holes for these rocks. You remove rust from bluestones. I don't think you can. Oh, you that's rust, what I had found. You mean rust from the well? From a well? Well, either from well water or from like a metal bench that rusted on. Oh. Um, there's probably ways to do it. Um, I've tried everything online. <laughs> Did you see the blues? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.